so you all should see that the room has changed. I'm going to start my webcam up so you can see me. Okay, there we go. Hello, everybody. Um, so my name is, as you heard, is Chrissy. And uh, we will be connecting a little bit later with the National Museum of the Marine Corps in Virginia. And I have two special guests that I'll be introducing you to uh, from that museum. So how the program will work, just to give you a little outline, is that I will spend about 15 minutes or so overviewing the war in the Pacific and specifically Iwo Jima. And then we're going to turn it over to the National Museum of the Marine Corps. And we will have uh, Jim Bish, who is the teacher in residence there. And also, uh, this wasn't advertised, but a surprise for you all watching live, a World War II veteran. His name is uh, Mr. Frank Matthews, and he was a flamethrower on Iwo Jima. A couple um, tips related to that is that you guys see this Q&A pod right below me here. Um, I would love for you all to type in questions for me, for uh, Mr. Bish, for Mr. Matthews, throughout the entire program, especially questions for our World War II veteran, Mr. Matthews. When we get to the part where we're talking with him, uh, I'll be looking at your student questions in that Q&A pod to ask him. And so I might be giving you guys you know, a little bit of a, a shout out uh, and, and choosing one of your questions. So please fill in that Q&A pod. Also, there'll be another way to interact, uh, poll questions. And I'm actually going to start this, this presentation off with a poll question for you guys out there. So I'm going to bring it up right now. And I'm going to expand it so you can see it. So my first question to start off our conversation today is how did the United States enter World War II? I'm going to give you guys some think, time to think about it. It's an easy question, hopefully, starting off today. But hopefully, it'll get a little harder. OK, and, uh, you guys, you know what you're talking about. I'm going to expand the results here. So yes, for those of you who said the fourth choice, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Uh, yes, that was how the United States, or the day after, is when the United States officially entered the war. So very good, guys. Awesome warm-up question. Uh, I'm going to end the poll um, right now. And um, let's see here. Let me get this out, out of the way. So yes, this uh, what you all will see on the screen is the very famous uh, front page of the Honolulu Star Bulletin, War, Oahu Bomb by Japanese Planes. Uh, that byline says six known dead, but when the day was over, 2,400 plus Americans had died in the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. And then, of course, this famous speech happened the day after. Let me make sure you guys can hear that. All right. Yesterday. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Okay, so uh, that was uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's very famous Day of Infamy speech to Congress, where he asked Congress to declare war on Japan, which happens. And in a few days after that, Germany declares war on the United States. So officially, the United States is at war. And we are specifically talking about today, of course, the war in the Pacific Theater, which you can see behind me, um, and of course, specifically Iwo Jima. So there had to be a strategy involved in the Pacific here, and that's what we're going to go to for the next slide. So you can see the entire Pacific theater in this next slide. And um, you know we had to have a strategy, because we didn't have airplanes that could fly to Japan from Pearl Harbor or from the United States from the mainland um, to attack the Japanese home islands. So what we have to do is we have to get a little bit closer uh, to even eventually for the potential of even landing forces on Japan. So we're trying to get closer and closer and closer. Uh, and that strategy is called uh, island hopping, which we're going to see come up on screen in a second. But So the attack on Pearl Harbor was December 7th of 1941. And uh, there it is, the island hopping strategy. And uh, then there were uh, Mid Midway was the first um, Allied victory. Guadalcanal later after that in August of 1942, the first Allied offensive. And you're going to see we're trying to get closer and closer to Japan with each landing on these different islands. Next, taking the Gilbert and Marshall Islands. 
the Marianas. That'll come into our story in just one second. Back to the Philippines. And then, of course, Iwo Jima, what we'll be talking about today. And then eventually after Iwo Jima, Okinawa. So you see how the strategy is moving us closer and closer to those Japanese home islands to eventually launch not only air attacks, but as I said, potentially the, the possibility of staging an actual invasion. So uh, at this time, when we, it is 1944, and uh, we are fighting on the Mariana Islands, and a new powerful weapon is ready. And that actually brings up my second poll question for you for you all. And it's going to come up on screen in just one second. What do you think what do you think that new weapon was? And this is a kind of a different poll question. You type in your answers versus selecting one. What do you think that powerful weapon was that was uh, ready to use at this time? I'm going to broadcast your results in just one second. Whoa, lots of results coming in. All right. Um, You'll see that every, almost everybody is saying the atomic bomb. So actually, I kind of tricked you. I was waiting to see that response. But it's actually a different weapon. We're, we're a little too early in the war for the atomic bomb to be ready. So sorry, that was a little bit of a trick question. Let me show you what weapon that was. The B-29 bomber. It was called the Super Fortress. Uh, the crew, 10 to 14 men, it could fly 3,250 miles and could carry 20,000 pounds of bombs. And uh, these planes were ready to fly to attack the Japanese home islands. There's a problem, though. Let me show you that, that problem right here on the next uh, slide. You can see that the flight path from uh, the uh, Mariana Islands to the Japanese home islands, there's something kind of smack dab in the middle of that flight path, and that is Iwo Jima. Now, uh, if B-29s are spotted on Iwo Jima, uh, the, uh, there are airfields on Iwo Jima where the Japanese can launch a counterattack against these B-29s so that these uh, US aircraft might not ever make it to the Japanese home islands to attack. Also, they could even send messages, send communications to the Japanese home island saying that these attacks are coming, taking away that element of surprise. And on that very long journey between the Mariana Islands and the Japanese home islands, uh, if those B-29s get in trouble, um, if they have some mechanical failures, there's really nowhere for them to land that's safe. So they're ditching their plane potentially in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so, so we had to take Iwo Jima, because uh, you can see it's right in the middle of that flight path. Also keep in mind, in this island hopping strategy, it's just putting us one step closer to those Japanese home islands. So here is Iwo Jima. Um, notice something interesting about this map. First off, I want you guys to pick out one more poll question. I know I'm asking a lot today. Um, I'm going to try to make sure this doesn't interfere with all of the map. Do you guys see what unit of measure for this map? It's very interesting and plays a big role in our story here. And I'm going to broadcast those results in just one second. All right, yes. Look at that. Uh, it's in yards. Isn't that really interesting? Usually when we see maps, that scale is usually within miles. Iwo Jima is such a small island that it's actually, let me show you the dimensions. It is two miles wide by four miles long, so eight square miles total. With the island being so small, um, there was you know, a lot of close range fighting, which, which made the casualty rate skyrocket. And we think about it, there are about 70,000 US troops, mostly Marines and some Navy, and close to 22,000 Japanese troops on the island. If you put, you know, add those two numbers together, almost 100,000 troops tightly packed on this teeny tiny island of eight square miles. And as I said, that close range fighting uh, pushed up the casualty rate. And there were three main airfields that uh, we wanted to attack because this is where the Japanese were launching those counterattacks to um, hit our B-29s. And you can see them here. And also at the bottom, a very distinct geographical feature of uh, Iwo Jima is Mount Suribachi. And we'll be seeing that in just one second. So the landings occur on February 19th of 1945. So that 70th anniversary was on uh, Thursday. And uh, notice something interesting about the sand uh, if you, in this picture. And I actually have sand from Iwo Jima right here. Not a typical sand you would see on, on the beach, you know, if you go on vacation or something like that. Notice it is black sand. 
Uh, Mount Suribachi uh, is a volcano. Uh, and uh, you can see here that um, the rest of the island is covered in this black sand. And that's what the Marines were landing on that day. Uh, you can see a Marine here using a flamethrower on the island of Iwo Jima. And uh, we will be talking to a flamethrower in just one second. And in the distance in this picture, you can see Mount Suribachi, the highest point of Iwo Jima. It was a lookout for the Japanese. And really, from, from that top of Suribachi, you could see just about the entire island. Uh, so that lookout point needed to be taken, and taken pretty early on. Uh, and here you can see this black sand was tricky to get through. Sinking in, whether it was people or vehicles or supplies, would sink in to this soft, black, you know, ashy sand. And finally, on um, February 23rd of 1945, today being the 70th anniversary, um, our Marines went up Mount Suribachi. They first sent a scout, a lookout group, to make sure everything was OK. Um, that group you know, didn't find any resistance. So um, a squad went up, and they went up with a flag to put on top of Mount Suribachi. Now it was a smaller flag. And when word actually, when that flag went up, and word went out that, uh, you know, that the Marines had finally gotten to the top. You know, people were. You know, it was, it was a moment um, where people were cheering from uh, the beaches below if they saw it. Uh, but the flag was kind of small, and we're actually going to talk. Um, the Marine Corps Museum will enlighten us a little bit more on the two different flags. This was such a small flag that eventually, though, there was a second flag that was put up there, uh, and hence this very iconic picture by Joe Rosenthal, photographer. Uh, and this is the photograph that we all know from Iwo Jima. And remember, this is the second flag raising, not the first, of this much larger flag. A question I get a lot, and um, pretty often here at the museum, well, I heard that that flag raising was staged, that it was posed. And I want to play you all, actually, a video from our collection here about, actually, no, it's not, it's not posed. And you're going to hear from Norm Hatch. Uh, telling you about the story of this second flag raising. What I'll do, everyone, while this is playing, is I'm going to pause my video and audio, and then I'm going to play the video, and then I'll come back when it's over. I was the photographic officer for the 5th Marine Division, and the 5th Marine Division had in its area of responsibility Mount Suribachi. It was decided that they would send a patrol up to see whether or not it was secure because the mountain was honeycombed with caves and positions. It had been a significant point of observation for the Japanese, and so we had to get rid of it because it was causing too much of a devastation. So uh, the patrol went up and said, well, it looks like it's pretty well secured. So they uh, sent up another group, and with them they had a flag. And sure enough, they found a good pole up there, and they put it on it and put the flag up. But it was too small. It was obvious to everybody on the shore that something had to be done. My boss came to me and said, Norm, they're going to put up a larger flag so that it can be seen by everybody. So I got word to two of my photographers, Bill Janaus, the movie man, and Bob Campbell, a still photographer, and I said, you better get over there to the mountain and go up there, going to put another flag up. On the way, they discovered Joe Rosenthal also going up. When the second flag went up, Rosenthal just got it by luck, and so did Bill Janaust. They were talking to each other, and Janaust was on Rosenthal's left, and he decided to go over and get on Rosenthal's right, just at the time they started to pick the flag up, and Rosenthal said, Hey, Bill, it's going right now. And Bill turned around and shot, and Rosenthal shot, and that was it. There were several things that caused the myth about the flag raisings. One was the fact that Joe Rosenthal was asked when he arrived at Guam whether or not he had posed a photograph on top of Mount Suribachi, and he said yes. But the picture he posed was the group of men underneath the flagpole. Then there were a lot of professional photographers that thought the picture was so good that he must have posed it. And Joe's answer to that was, if I was going to pose a picture, I wouldn't pose it with everybody's face turned away from me. 
it was an uplifting thing for the public at home. They thought that meant the battle was over. It really wasn't because the battle went on for another 27 or 28 days. But the public now has gone through four years of war. They were tired. They needed a lot of spurring to keep going in the war plans. And by appearing on the front pages of practically every newspaper in the country, it did it. So there's a little bit of background about the two flag raisings. And as I said, the National Museum of the Marine Corps, they're going to fill us in a little bit more, too. Um, before I close out with my part, I just want to give you a few statistics on Iwo Jima. And they're going to pop up on screen in just one second. The battle actually occurred for a little over a month. Um, most people think of that iconic flag raising within the first week. Um, but there was many, many days of battle after that. Uh, 19,000 US wounded. Uh, close to 7,000 U.S. deaths, and this is actually the only battle in the Pacific uh, during the war where U.S. casualties outnumber the Japanese casualties. So if you add up the U.S. deaths with wounded, uh, 25,000 plus um, casualties were compared to 21,000 or so casualties on the Japanese side. 27 medals of honor were awarded on this teeny tiny island. Um, but after it was taken, uh, those, those B-29 bombers going to and from the Japanese home islands, many of them uh, uh, made emergency landings, over 2,000, I think 2,400 emergency landings on Iwo Jima, which saved the lives of 22,000 uh, U.S. air crewmen. All right, so I'm going to actually end with that, with my part, and I'm going to turn it over to the National Museum of the Marine Corps. Um, and uh, as I said, we will be connecting with Jim Bish. He's our, the teacher in residence at the National Museum of the Marine Corps, and also veteran uh, uh, Frank Matthews. And uh, let's see here. I'm going to bring up their presentation. Can you hear me? Let's Can see. You? Looks like they're about to connect with us. All right, uh, Jim. Can you hear me? I see you there. Let's see if I can hear you. Yep, I can hear you just fine. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today, um, especially because I know your weather has been a little rotten over the past few days, too, uh, up in Virginia. So yes, I really, really said, appreciate you both Jim being Mish, here and today. I'm a teacher in residence at the National Museum of the Marine Corps. And sitting right next to me is Frank Matthews, who will be joining us just a little bit for some questions and answers as he was lived on the island for about a month. Okay, um, what we're going to talk about, um, first of all, is the flag raising. I'm going to spend probably five to ten minutes dealing with the flag raising. As you can tell, that image has been is very important to the National Museum of the Marine Corps. Um, not only is it one of the most iconic images in American history, but if you look at the design of our museum in Triangle, Virginia, it is designed around the triangular shape that the Marines and the Naval Corpsmen made as they put up the flag in Rosenthal's um, photo. And the core, and of course, you've got the mast of the ship, or excuse me, the mast of the flag coming out um, in a very similar design. So it's such an important image that the architecture of this building really reflects that. OK? That's fine. Um, All right. Yes, I'll Chris, you mentioned there, yeah. um, going up with the flag. The Easy Company was the group that was assigned to take the flag up. And Harold Schreier was given the flag by, by his Lieutenant Colonel Johnson. And he said, when you, take, when you go up there, make sure if you get to the top, put the flag up. So there was a group of about 40 Marines that headed up the mountain to put the flag up. This was in the early morning hours, probably 9.30 to 10 um, on the February on February 23rd, 1945. Okay. And of course, embedded within those right. 40 Marines was um, Lou Lowry. Lou Lowry was a staff sergeant, a photographer with Leatherneck Magazine, and he's going to be the man that actually shot the photographs documenting the first flag raising on top of Mount Sarabachi. Okay. And what you have here is just a couple of images dealing with um, different Marines putting together that first flag raising. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Frank now because I know he's got a good story of why those those poles, those metal poles, were even on Mount Sarabachi. It seems just kind of luck that they would find anything to 
put the flags up with. Not Suribachi, I was there, and it was a very important uh, uh, part of the Japanese belt to live on Iwo Jima because that island, for the last 250 years, the Japs have lived there, and it does not have any fresh water source. So the Japanese have survived all those years by collecting water, rainwater, uh, usually at the top of Mount Suribachi. So the pipes are used to bring all that rainwater down to a cistern inside of the uh, volcano. And when the, uh, our, our, our naval gunfire uh, got into a fight with the uh, Japanese uh, big guns on top of Suribachi, of course, we knocked all those pipes apart. So when they looked for a flagpole, all they had to do was look around for a piece of a pipe that had been used one time for the Japanese to bring water down into their cistern. Thank you, Frank. So you get a little bit there about some um, reason why. And you can go to the next slide. Okay, again, these are just some more images that Lowry had taken while he was waiting for the flag to go up. You can go ahead to the next one. And here they're getting ready to put the flag up. Unfortunately, um, Lou Lowry didn't have the, um, I don't know what it was, but in, in, unlike Rosenthal, he did not capture the moment of the flag going up. And that's really the real important thing. It's the act of doing the act of, if you think of it, a basketball shot um, is always the time when you're at the highest point of action, letting the ball loose or something like that. And even though there were a lot of photographs taken that day by Lou Lowry, none of them captured the moment of what the second flag will reveal. And that's the sad story about between the first and second flag raising is the second image, the, the <clears throat> second flag going up, that image of Rosenthal's, really just overpowered even the events that happened as far as the flags over on top of Mount Sarabachi. You can go ahead to the next one. Okay, this is the um, next flag, um, the next image of the first flag raising by Lou Lowry. Um, it's flying in the air. Of course, we don't have it up. They're just planting it in the ground, you know, kind of packing dirt around it so that it can be seen. This was roughly about 10.30 in the morning. And um, at that time, as Chrissy mentioned before, supposedly people that were around, especially ships that were close off the shores of Iwo Jima, started um, blowing their horns, things like that. It was obviously uh, something big had happened. And that's at the point that Japanese, realizing what had taken place, they didn't like that story so much. Okay? And this is when um, Japanese soldiers came out of a cave, and there was an enemy grenade was tossed. Lou Lowry, um, in the explosion and stuff, he, was, he fell to the ground with his with his camera. The camera was damaged, but he was able to save the film of that documenting that first that first flag raising. The um, pretty much the small action taken by the short firefight did not last that long and all the Japanese were taken care of that were up there that had come out of their caves. Okay? Here this is when you have the Secretary of Navy um, James Forrestal was on board with um, General Holland Smith and that's when they saw the flag up there and there are two important things that came out of this first of all Smith reportedly told Holland um, or Forrestal reportedly, reportedly told Holland Smith that the raising of the flag on Mount Sarabachi means the Marine Corps will last for another 500 years and the second thing he thought you know that would be a great souvenir to have so word was passed down <clears throat> word was passed down and <clears throat> Chandler Johnson, who was the commander, the battalion commander, said, no, no Navy, they're not going to capture that flag. That's not going to be a souvenir of, our, of theirs. It's going to be ours. So, so they did go ahead and, and find a larger flag. Go ahead. <clears throat> um, the larger flag supposedly was taken off an LST-779. Um, there's some controversy about this. The Marine Corps says it was LST-779. Um, there are other Coast Guard claims that was taken off L LST-758, some action. But as far as the official history, 779 is, is what it was. And, the, and, and a man by the name of Tuttle went ahead and found the flag, to found the larger flag that supposedly was a 
depot originally in Pearl Harbor, and from there they, <clears throat> from there they, um, the it was handled to Corporal um, Gagnon to take up the mountain for the second flag raising to improve the the site and make sure we had a larger flag so more people could see it. The flags were put up there really as a <clears throat> excuse me I've got a little cold as a morale builder for the um, Marines fighting below. Okay. And here you have um, just behind the second group that was going up with the second flag, the larger flag, you have embedded three photographers. One was um, Private Bob Campbell. The other one was Staff Sergeant Bill Genest, who was taking a movie <clears throat> picture. And then embedded with them was AP photographer Joe Rosenthal. They met Lou Lowry coming down the mountain as they were heading up. And Lou Lowry said that they, they'd already taken pictures of the first flag. Um, but he said, it's a great view from up there and go ahead and go up there and see what you can see. So the three men continued as Lou Lowry was coming down. <clears throat> okay, these are pictures now taken by Bill Genest. Um, he was the one with the, with the movie camera, so he caught the entire sequence of events and still frames going up. And you can, this kind of disproves any idea that this was staged, because as you earlier mentioned, Rosenthal and Genest almost missed it because they were getting set up for the camera and the Marines weren't paying attention to what they were doing. They had their job to do to get the flag up quickly and then make sure that they're protected. So as a result, Jeunesse just got this and that's when he told Bill, hey, it's going up. He told, or Bill told Joe it's going up and Joe swung around and caught the image that he did. But you, this kind of takes you through a series of images from the Jeunesse video to show you how it was. And there's the second image, okay? And this is the one where one four hundredth of a second in Joe Rosenthal's life would carry him through his lifetime. You've got this one image he shot. He didn't know he sh he, he'd gotten it because he turned around so quickly to shoot it. And he thought, you know, I don't know if I even got that. So I to make it worthwhile, I need to photograph the pictures kind of like um, Lowry did beforehand of Marines around the flag. So he did that just to make sure he had something be before he came off the mountain. Okay. Oops, sorry, went too far. <laughs> well, that's fine. We've got um, so at the time Rosenthal really didn't know if he had um, the the pictures or what he even had. He knew he had the photos that would later become known as the gung ho Im the the um, gung ho images that were of the Marines around the around the photograph, and that be became part of the controversy because later the um, images would be sent off to Guam. Joe would head down the mountain and by the time he got back off Mount Sarabachi, is, is the images still there? can't see him on my... Uh, let's see here. Yeah, camera. did it not show up? All right, we've got the cropped image of Iwo Jima that's up on the screen now. Might be, yeah, issues with lo a little bit of okay. loading on your end, um, but yeah, we have the cropped image of that, Iwo up on he, screen right um, now. Went ahead and uh, to, went down the mountain, and at one o'clock he said he noticed his watch, and it was at one o'clock, and um, and he sent him off to Guam. They ended up getting right out to Guam. They were developed in Guam, and again, I can't see any images, so if you want to. Let me. Move forward. Yeah, now we have the New York Times. It was Times, really remarkable um, that because within with 17 that hours, photo. I mean, everybody that that had developed the photos on Guam knew what they had. They go, oh my goodness, this is something that that everybody recognized the importance. So they quickly got those in the wire services. And it was really remarkable in the day that it from 17 hours from the time that Rosenthal took the picture, that it was actually part of, um, that it was in newspapers. And of course, this is an image that Chrissy had up earlier. Um, of the New York Times, um, which is on the 25th of February. So within two days after the shooting, 17 hours, it was already in newspapers across the United States, which was, which as I said, was really phenomenal to have done. Yeah, yeah it was the quickest was probably remarkable. they've ever had that now, kind of turnaround, right? unfortunately, the first film was sent later to Guam, the first flag raising pictures of Lowry, and that became part of the controversies because when it ended up in American newspapers as a flag raising. Everybody just assumed there was one flag raising and that became part of the problem. The second 
images did not make it to Qualm until after the sec the the first images I should say did not were not developed until after the second one was developed, and that was part of the problem. Okay. And then the next slide shows the gung ho shot, um, and then where then the other shot where you can see Rose. The gung ho taking, shot is um, a about, picture of that um, gung ho shot. Pretty obvious. The gung ho shot was proven that Rosenthal was there taking pictures in Genest, and that's the that's what later he would think or he would be asked. Rosenthal would be asked if he posed those pictures. They were talking about the real photograph of the flag raising. And, and Rosenthal thought that it was the gung-ho photos and said, yeah, we posed those, we had different people. So that also added to the controversy because Rosenthal at that point had not seen either one. Okay? And then this one, yeah, shows, uh, oh, yeah, I think you're talking about the controversy of it being developed. Um, and, oh, and now into the seventh war loan, saying, okay, uh, that's uh, picture so iconic. Yeah, How that's Roosevelt. Roosevelt had noticed that everybody war. was buying those images. They couldn't get enough of them. And he, sa he said, you know what, we're having problems because the seventh war, the seventh war drive, bond drive was having problems, is getting enough money. He said, that's the image, that's what we're going to use. And unfortunately, he also said, let's try to identify and find those Marines and get those back here that were in that picture. So you can go ahead. Yeah. And, yep. then, and then this shows Rosenthal. They're printing, um, you know, they're then, printing and printing and printing this image, like you were saying. And then um, yeah. a the next with one, you've got the Boy, Boy Scout, Scout troop, troop, and of I course, think. he's. Um, that just shows you how powerful it made Rosenthal an instant celebrity as well. Everybody wanted his name attached to the photo. And then this next one here shows the six flag raisers with the one yeah, misidentified Mr. Han, um, initially. He's going to be unidentified Hansen. throughout the entire Bond rally. Um, he, the, they're both, both Hanson. Hanson's died, and, um, uh, and as a result, nobody steps forward. The man that actually knew that it was not was correct was Ira Hayes, but he remained silent because they didn't want to cause even more controversy because the first flag raisers were not brought back home for this. So there was a lot of a lot of issues, and the Marines were dealing with a lot of these issues with the conflict. Then, of course, you have the second Bond rally. You go forward, you're going to see um, Tracer Spence, Spencer Tracy and James Cagney. Oh, yeah. Let's see here. Let me get all to the, that. All oh, the there celebrity we go. status that of that slide. image. Yeah, James Cagney and Spencer okay, Tracy. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And here you have, unfortunately... Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the flag was then taken off Mount was Saribachi. Capital, it was yeah. brought back, and unfortunately, by the time that President Roosevelt wanted that flag, wanted the flag back here for the Bond rally in that image, they brought the flag back for the for this to go along with the Bond drive. And unfortunately, President Eisenhower died on April 12th. So as a result of that, um, it flat the, the last days of his mourning period, the flag flew over the Capitol building. Um, before it went out on the bond drive rally. You mean President Roosevelt? I mean right? President Roosevelt, yes. Before <clears throat> President Roosevelt wow. during his funeral. Wow. Okay. Yeah, this is and the, got a bond, of the tour. bond tour here. Yeah. Of course, you have John, um, the the naval corpsman, John um, Bradley, is on crutches. He was wounded. Okay. Yeah, these are the three survivors. All right, and then, at, then holding uh, within the Within 28 flag. days after the flag raising, three of the five Marines and one naval corpsman had been killed. Um, three of the Marines had been killed, and these were the only two Marine survivors in Bradley that were part of the survivors that were able to come back for the Bond tour. And this is... In Los Angeles, this yeah, even right shows you, you Los got Angeles. an image on buildings of how important that image was of Iwo Jima as the final. So the flag, the Marines, um, Bradley, um, were all on this, this bond tour, which raised more money than any previous bond tour or bond drive in World War II history. Okay? And the stamp yeah, is important. Have I have an actual... Postage stamp. This is a first day cover of the stamp 
This is an original. It came out in July 1945 oh, wow. from Washington, D.C. It um, it sold more stamps. People supposedly were lined up for blocks to get that image of that first stamp. A little bit of controversy because there were live people there. They had three people that were live, and the post office said they would not allow for a stamp to be have anyone that's alive on a stamp. So that finally was dealt with, and it supposedly became the most purchased stamp through the 60s, and legend has it that it was the most purchased, purchased stamp by the Postal Service up until the death of Elvis Presley in the 1970s. Okay. Wow. And then uh, this shows yeah, all their positions on the flag. This is after and then the Bond Block rally. Me. Ira Hayes finally went to Block's parents and said, you know, your son was the one that planted, was at the base. And the con this added to more controversy. Um, Hansen was taken off then after they had enough proof that it was Block. So it's just one one problem after another. But you can imagine, <clears throat> for Marines, this was just a small thing in a day of keeping keeping alive. Their real task was to keep alive and keep their friends around them alive and do their job of liberating Iwo Jima. This was just something that was not that important by putting a pole up and doing what they did. It, fraction, it took a few seconds out of their day. So paying attention to who was actually holding on to that pole was not something important to them at the time as the image made it an important event. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then it looks like uh, the uh, mock-up for the Marine Corps Memorial, which uh, we see in these next couple yeah. images there mm -hmm. with Truman, also looking at a sculpture. Right, and, and of uh, course and by the, the late 1940s, yeah, the, the Marine of the Corps memorial. was going to put up the memorial um, based upon that image, which we now know as the Iwo Jima Memorial. And at that time, there was also controversy because some of the Marines from the first, and even Hanson's family, who was identified with the first, with the second flag raising for a while, um, and then was removed, they were not given um, the credit they felt that they should have been given um, because they were the, especially the first flag raisers. They were the ones that really cleared the mountain and went up there and sacrificed their lives to get the first flag up. So, so that, and, and of course, the the Marine Corps kind of squashed that for a while too. When they already had this huge image out there, then the second image just came on board. They kind of, you know, said, "Hey, we've already got an image. Don't mess up the story." So it, it was it was a lot of unintended consequences all the way around. Mm -hmm. And that, um, and if you go to the end, yep, uh, all the way to the end here. Oh yeah, I think this is the uh, with. Um, all the, at the living, the flag, living flag, flag raisers, raisers there's at the Bradley, dedication and you've ceremony. got Cognan, and you've got um, Hayes there, along with Vice President um, Nixon at the dedication. And then if you go past that, again, that's a lasting monument because our emblem for the National Museum of the Marine Corps is the is the image, kind of, um, with the National Museum of the Marine Corps. And if you go to the very end. Yeah. Which there you see again the um, the real image with the shape of our building here at the National Museum of the Marine Corps and Triangle. And with that, great. Thank you so much, Jim. I really appreciate sure. it. Uh, can you take one question before we turn it over to Frank? So speaking of controversy, I don't know if you guys can speak to this, but uh, actually the uh, high school in North Platte, Nebraska, they were asking. There's been controversy recently about the identification of John Bradley and that um, maybe not being accurate. You know, can you speak to that so at all? There's been so many controversies in the last 45 or last 70 years concerning the flag racings. Um, recently, there have been some images looked at very closely concerning John um, Brad Bradley that he was he was misidentified and that he shouldn't have been part of the second flag raising. I would. A lot of people that have really looked at that say that's suspect as well. I don't, I don't know um, one way or the other. I would suggest, though, that Bradley, because he was one of those that were actually alive at the end, that um, if there was any doubt throughout his time period, that that would have risen before this. But, but it certainly, and I know I think one of the um, areas that that circulated out of was out of Omaha. Since I'm from Nebraska, I kept up on some of that as well. So go Huskers for you out there in, in North Platte. And, and at, because this has always been controversial, I'm sure that for the next 70 years, there will continue to be much more controversy over the flag raisings. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jim. And, yeah, now um, 
students prepare your questions for our um, special guest today, our other special guest, uh, veteran Frank Matthews. Glad to be here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Frank. Oh, great. Well, we're we're happy to have you too. I'm actually going to make our video. Let's see, a little bit bigger so everybody okay. can see can see you a little clearer here. There we go. Um, so yeah. So now that now that you're on the big screen here. Um, so I, I wanted to know, um, kind of, we're going to go back to the beginning a little bit, and I was curious, um, how old were you um, and when the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred, and when did when you, uh, you know, occurred. join up in the Marine Corps? Oh, that would be, of course, 1941. Uh, I was about 15 years old, so I was in second year high school in South Carolina where I grew up, and uh, for the next couple of years, everything was a little tight. You didn't do anything that you normally did, but I graduated from high school, 1943. I went immediately and joined the Marine Corps, went down to Paris Island, went through boot camp early 43, and uh, they sent me up to Quantico for a while. And uh, then Quantico, uh, in the middle of uh, August, 1944, they came in and somebody knew that they were, the uh, Battle of Iwo Jima was gonna happen. And so they pulled us through, a whole bunch of us out of the uh, of Quantico, sent me on a troop train all the way down to New Orleans. And we stopped there briefly, did calisthenics, and then took a train on out to the West Coast. And from there we got aboard a troop transport, went all the way out to Pearl Harbor. And by uh, early December 1944, I had been assigned to the 4th Marine Division on the island of Maui. And the island, uh, there are third and fourth and fifth Marines divisions. Those are the divisions that landed on Iwo Jima. The fourth was stationed on uh, Maui. The, uh, the, uh, the fifth division was on the big island of Hawaii. The third division was located in uh, Guam. We all got together, uh, the third, fourth, the fifth, and we went from uh, Pearl Harbor, took us about six weeks to go to Iwo Jima on a huge convoy of ships. And we landed on Iwo Jima. I went in on the first day. Uh, I was landing on the uh, right flank of the island where the minor, minor division, the fourth division, was supposed to, uh, to, to attack. So we were on the opposite end of the island from the flag raisers, the fifth division. 28th Regiment out of the 5th Division raised the flag then on the fourth day. On that particular day, which was 70 years ago today, uh, I was just trying to get over having participated in taking the first airfield on the previous day. And uh, it wasn't more than a day after that that I got the first of three wounds that I got on Iwo Jima. These wounds were not sufficient that I could had to be evacuated. I didn't want to be evacuated. So uh, the corpsman, that's of course the medics, kept me bandaged up. I managed to tough it out until the end of the battle. Wow. Um, a lot of students, well, first off, there's a lot of students in the audience <laughs> saying, thank you for that. your service. <laughs> I haven't seen that a lot. Um, <laughs> and uh, we also uh, we're seeing a lot of questions about um, you know what what was your job on the island? They know flamethrower, and someone was curious I about how much did the flamethrower even weigh? At first, which is roughly uh, akin to the uh, AK-47 that uh, they've used recently, and it had a lot of good features, and it was a very rugged weapon. I carried it for the first uh, three weeks on Iwo Jima. The last week, they switched me mostly to a flamethrower. Flamethrower weighed 83 pounds. I thought it was very unfair for them, for them to ask me to carry it because I only weighed 155 pounds myself. But the flamethrower was a, 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 what we call a, a, the M2 flamethrower. And uh, you can see pictures of that. Uh, the flamethrower would carry enough uh, fuel for about a three-minute burst of flight. We had to make that last all day, though, or at least half a day, when we went out on patrol. Wow. Um, 
Um, and then we're getting a few more questions too about the conditions on Iwo Jima. Um, what you know? What was it like? How was it living on the island? Did you? What we did you all eat Iwo while Jima you were there? Those February. sorts of things. Iwo Jima is the same latitude as Key West, Florida, and you know how Key West, Florida is in February. It's not too cold, and so that Iwo Jima is not too cold. And anyway, you had some volcanic uh, action still going on, although the volcano there has not erupted in twenty-four thousand years. So. Uh, that's Mount Suribachi. I was not on Mount Suribachi. I was on the other end of the island. And so I didn't see the flag go up, although I had a lot of buddies who did. They were in the units that raised it, the 28th. But the 4th Division on the other end of the island, we were concerned with taking a first, and then we had two more airfields to take after that. And on our end of the island, there was a great deal of the underground Japanese emplacements. And then, um, what you know, what what were um, what were some of the thoughts going through your head? A lot of students were wondering if you were scared, or you know, what was it like Washington day to Post, day? You example, know, what you were thinking. One of their uh, questions to me, not too long ago, was what how what, was I afraid on Iwo Jima? And I pointed out to them that I had joined the Fourth Division uh, about a month before we left for Iwo Jima, and so I was uh, the, the guys I was going into Iwo Jima with had already been in four battles. Fourth Division, Iwo Jima was our fifth battle in World War II. But, uh, so I was, uh, well, the main thing that went through my mind as we landed that morning, which uh, was uh, 70 years ago on the 19th, the main thing going through my mind was, uh, I was afraid, but not in the way you think. I was afraid that I was gonna do something stupid. All of them had already been in combat. I never had been. So that was my thought for the first few days on Iwo Jima. Don't do something I'm not supposed to. Because all, all of the other guys were uh, uh, old vets, and they gave me a lot of good uh, help, by the way. Um, did you... Uh, now, you said you were wounded three times, but weren't you... One, the only one, or the one of your only one of your squad to make it off. Well, the last the day that I was on Iwo Jima, Jima which was the twenty eighth uh, day of the battle, and that was the last day that my unit was there, so I had to leave, whether I was well or not. Um, I had had three wounds, but none of them was sufficient to to put me off the island if I didn't want to be. So. Uh, on that last day, there were 36, should have been 36 men in my platoon. That's how many men there are in a Marine platoon. But there was only one there that day as we got aboard ship heading back to Maui, and that was me. So we got off, we got on the, uh, on the uh, ship, and I was bandaged up somewhat, but I made it back to uh, Maui. And uh, I can show you a picture if it would mean anything to uh, your uh, viewers. This is me I'm about a week after we got back to Maui. Can you see it? I mean, that's hold it up a little higher, closer to like your face. Yeah, 19, there we go. <laughs> about a week after we got back to Maui. Wow. And were you recovering from your wounds then in Maui? And, you know, for the what happened through the rest of the war? Were you ever, you know, um, you know, assigned any other battle the war, or we were getting ready to assignments or Japan. before the war ended? And um, so we were getting, well, they built a mock village, a mock Japanese village there on the island of Maui. And we practiced getting ready to uh, hit Japan, which we never had to do because the war ended in August of 1945. And I came home and eventually I went to college and all that stuff later. Um, some students in the audience were wondering, you know, how, you know, I'm sure you saw, you know, many terrible things on Iwo Jima. Um, you know, we talked about the battle being, you know, it's such close range combat. 
Um, how did you deal with those things when you, you know, either on the island or returning home? You know, were those difficult things? The first to, night to get on Iwo Jima was um, the worst. Back here the was States. the worst for me in terms of face-to-face -face combat with the Japanese. We uh, we landed on the island, and our job was to get down to where the uh, uh, fourth division had had a third battalion of the twenty-fifth had been uh, almost cut to pieces. They had started out the battle with 900 men on the morning that we landed. And by the afternoon, they were down to 150 survivors. They lost 750 men, mostly killed. So they got on the radio and they said, we need help. And my unit was a division reserved for the 4th Division. They put us on several different vessels uh, we, we didn't have access to Higgins boats. We, we had to come in on what was called an LSM, carried five tanks. And they had already uh, unloaded their tanks on the beach. So the, they got us in, but they couldn't get us in at the right place because it was a total disaster on D-Day on Iwo Jima. So we had to land us on the complete left flank right near the volcano. And then my unit had to walk almost a mile until we got all the way down to where we were supposed to be on the complete other end of the beach. And uh, as we were walking along, we were trying to hold on to the other four men in our fire team. And um, we managed to get down there, and we found that the Japanese were coming up, trying to take retake that end of the beach because... Uh, they wanted to be able to fire from both ends of the beach down the beach, which they call their uh, they call their uh, uh, death trap. And so they were coming up from underground, and they had usually they would have a, a a sword, or they would have some kind of a bayonet, and you could see in their faces there and the flickering light from whatever light source was coming up there that. They were anticipating a little battle, a little fight with the stupid Marines uh, with a sword fight. Well, we had bayonets, but we had no intention of, of working on fighting them on their terms. So we would do two things. First, we would parry and knock their sword away if it got that close. The second thing is we would shoot. And so I could see in a lot of faces the Japanese, as they died, from my having just shot them, they, you can see the contempt that they were in their eyes. This stupid Marine didn't even know how to play the game. I wasn't interested in playing that game. And that went on the first night. The next morning, the Navy brought in a great big battleship, uh, New Jersey, and uh, they forced the Japanese to get back in the underground tunnels. And we started getting organized on the beach. But we were on the other end, away from the flag. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a couple students uh, in the audience were wondering, you know, did you have any good friends on, you know, Iwo Jima, you know, from your from your squad, um, you know, and did in one of my best friends on the island. I, I don't remember how I got got to know him. Was the uh, division mail sergeant. And he was from uh, Pennsylvania. His last name was Allen, A-H-L-I-N. I lost track of him after the war. But uh, he was a real energetic kid, and he was a sergeant. I was just a private first class at that point. But uh, he managed to get a mail tent up and going. And we have a picture of that mail tent at the museum. And in the back, in the shadow underneath, you can see a shadowy black figure up under there, and that's me, because I helped him get his the tent going up, and he got the tent up and was the only one who got a tent. We were the only division to get a tent going, and so we handled the mail for all the other two divisions on Iwo Jima, the other units that came in there for the whole battle. So with the 4th Division did get a mail tent going. I was a part of that, but I, my you were job part of then that. was to <laughs> began to be uh, more and more to go out on patrols. I went out on patrols almost every day for the next 28 days I was on the island. Wow. 
Um, now, returning home, uh, since we're getting a little close to the end of time today, uh, do you, um, I, I was reading that article with, uh, about you in the paper about composing music uh, again and, and then playing and having those pieces played at the National Museum of the Marine Corps and, and those pieces being a tribute to um, you know, your uh, fellow soldiers who were, you know, injured or Surely. killed on Iwo Jima. Uh, Can you talk a, a little bit more Marines about that? A lot of Marines had their little habits, their little uh, hobbies that they did. A lot of them wrote articles and then uh, kept notes about what they did. Sometimes you were not supposed to, but a lot of people drew pictures. A lot of Marine, Marines were artists. They drew pictures of place, things that they saw wherever they were. Uh, I had my own little hobby because I was a, I had grown up in South Carolina. My father was a minister. I had learned to play piano and organ. So when I went in the Marine Corps, the chaplains discovered this, and they started using me to play the organ for a lot of the church services, which at first was a little bad. They, my other Marines would laugh at me because of the fact that I was uh, going and playing for church services while they would be out maybe having a beer somewhere. And I, I found out real soon, though, when we got to Hawaii, and especially after Iwo Jima, uh, that um, uh, I went to some of the churches, and you, uh, you would run into a, a, a lot more pretty girls there than you would at some beer parlor. So I got used to the idea that it wasn't such a bad thing. <laughs> but anyway, that's what I did uh, as a part of my part-time. <laughs> I, I, I wrote a lot of little music pieces, and then over the years, as I uh, finished college and majored in music, and I have several degrees and taught music at college level, that um, uh, the music I wrote, I have, it's my personal thing, but I have a lot of music that I orchestrated, and we have, uh, some of it has been performed, but I've never pushed it. So uh, that was my hobby, and uh, sometimes now there are, are some organizations who uh, are getting ready and have done some of my music recently. Well, if they find this interesting, but realize, please, that it's my own interest, and I'm not trying to push my music. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. And I guess uh, I think we are at our at least 1 o'clock Central Time, 2 o'clock your time Eastern, and I don't want to keep students and teachers any longer if they're on a schedule. So. Um, Mr. Matthews, thank you so thank you. much I've for being with us today and, and sharing some of your story. Uh, we, we have as well, and, and Jim, thank you as well for, um, for your insight on uh, the flag raisings today. You guys stay warm up there, and I'm going to actually close out the program today. I'm going to move into a different area. You're going to see the room change one more time. And I want to close out today with telling you all about our essay contest. Um, we uh, have an annual essay contest uh, here at the museum every year. This year, it is about Iwo Jima and this idea of what makes a hero based on this flag raising um, and based on some famous words by one of the flag raisers, Ira Hayes. You know, he said, how could I feel like a hero when only five men in my platoon of 45 survived, when only 27 men in my company of 250 managed to escape injury or death on Iwo Jima. And we want you all to respond to that um, question, you know, what makes a hero? You can find more information about that as a contest at the link that you see there. Um, I also want to tell teachers, you can see your web links. Um, so if some of you might have not received a teacher guide, especially if you registered just today. Um, so you can find all of our educational resources and, of course, uh, uh, everything that we have to offer on uh, Iwo Jima, and of course a link to our wonderful special guests at the National Museum of the Marine Corps. Um, what I want to close out with today is actually um, one more poll um, for you students out there, and then we're going to end it for today. I'm going to drag it right in from this Q&A area so you guys can see it. And it's a very famous quote by Chester Nimitz, and he said this, um, what you see on screen. What do you think this quote means? Of the Marines on Iwo Jima, uncommon valor was a common virtue. I want you guys to think about that as a class and respond to what, what you think that means. You know, that's one of the most famous quotes from, you know, a lot, there's a lot of famous quotes from World War II, but that's one of them up there. And um, I want you to brainstorm about it as a class um, and, you know, what we've learned today.
but from Chrissy here at uh, the National World War II Museum and thanking